Hello, everybody. We are just about to begin. Hello and welcome to this meeting. I'm Vanessa Maydew, the Communications and Knowledge Exchange Specialist for SEBI Livestock, the Center for Supporting Evidence-Based Interventions in Livestock, which facilitates the Livestock Data for Decisions, or LD for D, Community of Practice. Um, some technical guidance before we get started, if you can rename yourself um, with your fir first name and last name and organization so we know who you are. To do this, open the participants list in Zoom, hover over your name and click more. Um, you're welcome to have your video on as we would love to see your faces, but we will keep you on mute until discussions begin. And finally, you can use the chat anytime for questions and comments and we will do our best to address these throughout the meeting in the chat. So uh, today's session is part of our annual LD4D community meeting, which has been taking place all week. Uh, hopefully you already know about our exciting program of webinars and workshops on livestock data topics, including environment, pastoralist systems, ontologies, gender, and much more. You can also connect, share, and learn with your peers using the Brain Date Learning platform. Um, so after the session, there will be, if you want to continue the conversation, you can log into Braindate and join that. There's one spot left, I think. Or you can start your own conversations, uh, post any topic based on your expertise, curiosity, or needs, or join an existing group discussion. Um, without delay, I will hand over to Edna massé Calon, who is from the World Organization for Animal Health, and she is also an LD for D steering committee member. Thanks very much. I guess it's good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody, because you're all from different time zones. Um, I hope you can share my, see my screen quite well. My name is Edna Massey-Colon, and I am the um, WOHAS, the World Organization for Animal Health, technical lead for the GBATS um, program. GBATS is co-led by, the, by um, WOHA and University of Liverpool, but it's implemented by a consortium of partners, and you'll be hearing from some of these partners today. The agenda for our meeting is as follows. Um, after I make my brief speech, um, Dr. Matthew Stone, who used to be the former DDG at WOHA, will give you an overview of the program. We will then go on to talk, providing you a showcase on what we've been doing around the economics of animal health split into three parts. The first one will be around animal populations and the health loss envelope. The second will be concerning human health and the wider economic impact. And the third will be around ontologies, informatics, and the case studies. And then there'll be a closing um, with some words and thoughts from Matthew again. And then I will just let you know about the next steps and how to get in touch with us after this event. So what is the objective of this session? We want to share with you the progress from our, what's going on with the GBATS program. So in terms of our methods, our data needs information at global, regional, and country levels, and also what we have planned around education. And we also want to discuss potential areas, um, areas of potential collaboration with you all within the LD4D community. So what I ask and what we ask from you for this event today is basically for your engagement during this session and by providing us with your comments, asking any questions you may have, and participating in the mentee polls that we do have. And also, let's also discuss potential collaboration after this event. I will tell you all, provide you all at the end of ways to do that. And then also, please provide us with feedback on this session using the following QR code as well. So I will hand it over to Dr. Matthew Stone and I will stop sharing and let him take over. Greetings everyone. It's uh, fantastic to be with you all. Uh, I'm giving this overview on behalf of the director of GBADS, which is the Professor Jonathan Rushton uh, and his uh, colleagues or our colleagues, in fact, Ben Huntington and Edna. Um, there is indeed, if you, I'm sure Jonathan is known to all of you, uh, and his recorded delivery of this introduction, and of course, many of the other papers uh, delivered at the ISV special session uh, is available on the GBADS website. So what are we trying to achieve? We're trying to achieve better decision-making. Uh, better decision-making for livestock keepers, consumers, 
uh, and investors. Um, that decision making will cover, cover investment plans, the allocation of resources, and evaluation of investments. Going straight to an overview of the GBAD's analytical structure, as we call it. This involves information on livestock populations, their biomass and their inputs, the value of the animals themselves and the value of their outputs or offtakes, as we say. We construct a theoretical animal health loss envelope, which has an upper ceiling and a lower bound of reality that looks at how much are we losing and how much are we spending. We want to attribute that by disease, health problems and accidents to achieve the absolute burden due to each disease and the relative burden compared to the total burden. And we also intend to look at the impact across the wider economy in terms of who is also affected in the wider society. Now, of course, we need detailed data uh, and we need uh, an, uh, a classification framework for that data that uh, addresses livestock population at species level and at production systems level. We need to consider the classification at the farm level economics and population dynamics to create this animal health loss envelope. Going into cause and risk factor attribution in the wider economy and thinking across the data that we need the various analyses that we'll undertake and the information that that will derive. So a busy slide, but a more detailed overview of the analytical process. And of course, this is data driven. So what is the sort of data that GBADS needs? We need population data, production performance data, animal health expenditure, incidence prevalence of, of different diseases that we want to attribute, mortality and morbidity impacts. We will be considering zoonotic impacts, uh, the transmission of disease from livestock to people. And ultimately, we, we would like to understand the impact of interventions, legislative or others, on people's management of animal disease. The analytical process is supported by uh, a modeling process uh, with conceptualization of, of model, models with a variety of parameters, uh, all of which goes through uh, a process-based model and delivers us the model outputs. There is, of course, an intense process of development going on uh, around those models and their verification and validation so that they can consistently treat the data flows uh, and the output is validated, ideally through comparison with real world data. So we're trying to make this process repeatable and consistent across the different levels from local up to national, to global. We intend to undertake an ongoing series of analyses, both cross-sectional in terms of considering specific investments and allocations so that we might understand misallocation of resources, efficiency or inefficiency at the farm level, and also at the wider economy level. And we also want to make this process longitudinal through a process of evaluation of at time series and the change of burden and pitching that against changes in policy. We're building a knowledge engine to host the data and the analytical processes and to produce a series of dashboards. Dashboards that estimate the burden at the global level sector level and at the country level. And all this will be linked with clear description of the analytical processes and providing 
information that users can download, link to directly, uh, or view in the dashboard. So uh, as an overview, the GBADS process involves a knowledge engine with strate strategic alliances delivering data on resources being put through an analytical process, delivering the animal disease burden, thinking across efficiency, equity, and also supporting information about environmental impact. This drives consideration of further need for investment, resource allocation, and evaluation. Now, probably the greatest success uh, in the GBADS program so far is the coalition of partners that's been built. Partners donating resources to the program and, uh, and partners helping us implement the program. Now that's a very brief overview. I hope I've kept within the five minutes. I'll pass back to you, Edna, uh, for the rest of the presentations in more detail. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Matthew for the wonderful overview. I will now pass it on to my colleague, um, Dr. Dai Mabry, to start us off um, on our method showcase with her presentation. Thanks, Edna, and thank you, Matthew, for the overview to start us off with. Um, my name's Dai Mabry, and I'm presenting this work today on behalf of my colleagues from the GBADS Populations and Production Systems theme at CSIRO and Cornell University. So we know that the causes and the scale of production losses vary between countries, species, and systems. We also know that the impact of these losses vary. So how can we compare the disease burden of intensively raised goats with extensively grazed cattle? They're different sizes, they produce different things, and they're valued differently. Our work in the production and population systems theme aims to develop methods to classify different production systems and to quantify the biomass and the value of livestock within these systems. This data can then be used as the baseline or the denominator for understanding the burden of disease. Biomass is a measure of abundance that allows us to compare animals of different sizes. We know that one sheep or goat doesn't weigh the same as a cow. It also probably costs less, eats less, requires less inputs, and has a smaller environmental impact. So while not perfect, using biomass instead of population provides a more useful method of comparison between species and systems than simply counting the number of heads. So how do we do this? In a perfect world, we'd know exactly how many animals there are in a given population and how much each one of those animals weigh. But this isn't possible for most farms I work on, let alone at a national or a regional scale. So instead, we've had to use average values or proxy data like slaughter weight to estimate biomass. And this work has been led by my colleague, Yin Lee. We've worked through a number of different ways to estimate biomass, depending on the scale of the analysis and what data is available at that level. To describe these approaches, we've borrowed from the tier system that the IPCC uses to describe emissions factors and activity data when they're calculating greenhouse gas emissions for different countries. These tiers represent the complexity of the methods and the accuracy of the results. The tier three methods at the top of the table are the gold standard. They should provide the most accurate results, but they also have the greatest data requirements. This would describe methods where you have the population and the live weight data for each group of animals. For example, the number and the live weight of all of the cows, bulls, heifers, and calves in a, in a population of cattle, and possibly for each breed of cattle. You might also have data that's specific for different regions and production systems within a country. This level of data might be collected in livestock censuses or local surveys. The tier two methods are also country specific, but they don't have the same level of disaggregation or local accuracy as tier three. 
And then the tier one methods are the least accurate. And I think of them as your back of the envelope calculation. But because they're usually based on global databases, they're easily scalable. Data on populations might come from Fowlstat, and for live weight, you might use tropical livestock units or another generic estimate of live weight, which is the same across all of the different countries. So the figure on the right hand side of this slide is an illustration of the biomass estimates for cattle and sheep in Ethiopia using a range of different methods and data. As well as highlighting the difference in biomass between the two species, this figure also shows the range in biomass estimates from six different approaches. For, she for sheep, all of the data clusters around a small point. So we can be pretty comfortable with our estimate of about a billion kilos of live weight. But for cattle, there's a lot more variation. While it's not illustrated here, we've also broken these national biomass estimates down into production systems using a tier three approach. So in Ethiopia, livestock are kept in three main systems. Um, there's a mixed crop livestock system, an extensive pastoral system, and then specialized intensive systems. For cattle, about 77% of the biomass is in the mixed system, 17% in the pastoral system, and 6% in those specialized dairy systems. For sheep, it's a much more even split between the mixed and the pastoral systems with 56% of biomass associated with the mixed system. We've also calculated biomass for the most important livestock species at a global scale using a tier one approach and the FALSTAT data. The total livestock biomass and livestock populations have been increasing over the past few decades with the greatest contributions from cattle, but an increasing contribution from chickens and small ruminants reflecting their increasing population size. At the moment, we've just estimated biomass at the global scale for, at the country level, but our next step is to try and break this down by production system at the global scale. We're also working on improving our national biomass estimates through use of more accurate data on herd structures and characteristics of livestock in different systems using a tier three approach. Building on the biomass work, we're also doing some activities to estimate the economic value of livestock. This provides an important baseline for the production loss envelope work because knowing the value of different species is important to understand both the total and the relative value of what's lost due to disease. And this work has been led by Peggy Schroback. And Peggy is using this total economic value framework to highlight the many ways in which livestock are valued. The framework is frequently used in other economic fields and includes use values for the sale of livestock and their products, but also non-use values including bequest, altruistic and existence value. Like the biomass work, this initial analysis has been limited by what data is available. And we started with a global analysis, which has forced us to focus on quantifying just the direct use, of, direct use value of livestock highlighted in that little orange circle. And while there are farm and case studies that provide information on the value of draft, genetics and non-use values, they're impossible to get at a global scale. So I do want to highlight that the work I'm presenting is just a, a small fraction of this total economic value, but will hopefully capture some of the non-use value in the case study countries. And we've already had lots of interesting discussions about how we combine all of these different estimates to get a total economic value without any double counting. Within the direct use value, we're currently estimating the value of live animals and their primary products like meat, milk and eggs. The value of a live animal is taken as its current market value and in many markets that would consider some of their potential future output. So these figures show the value of live animals on the left and their products on the right for the major terrestrial livestock species, cattle, pigs, chickens, goats, and sheep. And the values presented are for a single point in time or a single year. So they're not a lifetime assessment of the value of these species. Overall, the value of live, live animals over time has been slightly higher than the value 
of their primary outputs, but there are differences between the species. So for larger animals like cattle, the live animal value is higher than the value of their products on average at a global scale. Um, and the reverse is true for pigs and poultry, where the value of the outputs is greater than the live animals. And for both value categories, the cattle sector, which is in red in these graphs, is, um, dominates the value generation, similar to what we saw with the biomass. And finally, this figure shows our initial estimates of the global value of livestock. The bottom line is the value of the live animals, and the top line is the value of the live animals plus their products. So the top line is probably an overestimate of the total value, and the true direct use value is likely sitting somewhere in between. So for 2018, it likely sits somewhere between 1.6 and 3 trillion US dollars. And of course, these values will increase if we're able to capture the value of secondary products like hides, the service value of animals for draft and transport, and the non-use and social cultural values of livestock, which is so important in many of the countries that we're working with. So next steps for the economic work. We're currently working on understanding investments into animal health using data from 15 case study countries and data from the IFCN Dairy Research Network. The data that we've been given by IFCN allows us to understand how much is spent on animal health compared to other farm costs like feed and labour. However, what's missing from this data set is a breakdown of those health costs into different categories like treatment and prevention. And so that's where I'm hoping some of you in the audience this evening might be able to help us out. So I've got a list of 15 countries on this slide. If you're an expert on dairy systems in any of these countries, or you can recommend us an expert in one of these countries, we would love to hear from you and have a chat about some of our health estimates. So just to finish off, um, Biomass and economic value can be used as denominators for disease burden estimates. We've provided some initial estimates, which we'll refine over the next few months. And you might hear more about them this evening about how they're used in GBADS. We're developing and evaluating a range of different approaches, and there's no one method that suits all countries and all scales of analysis. Related to this, we've also found that there are large data gaps particularly when we try to analyse the biomass and the value of livestock at the production system level. And further work is required to understand the total value of livestock production. And so with that, thank you. And I will pass you on to Will to talk about animal health loss envelopes. Hello, everyone, and I hope that's now um, showing my presentation. And um, thanks for the opportunity to present today. And I'm going to give an overview then as of the. Um, am I am I sharing my presenter view instead of like? Oh, no, nope, it looks good. Well, well done. Keep going. Okay. Okay. Um, so um, I'm going to sort of give an overview of the animal health loss envelope quickly, which is the, the kind of quantitative starting point for our um, burden estimates. And um, uh, this presentation is going to have a sort of three part structure where um, kind of explaining the reasoning why we've developed this kind of method in the first place, then how we go from a sort of concept to a measurement model and how then we expand that measurement model in a way that allows this sort of same standardized approach to be taken to the kind of broad diversity of global livestock systems. Um, <clears throat> so essentially the animal health loss envelope is um, the idea that there's a gap between how livestock systems perform in ideal health um, as opposed to how they function in the real world. Um, and that that gap um, would be measurable and could be termed a health loss envelope. 
and from a methodological point of view and it, it kind of serves a few purposes um firstly um it's it puts a boundary around total uh, disease burden estimates and there's some evidence from both human and animal health economics that that um, aggregating uh, different causes of morbidity and mortality together can um, carries a risk of systematic um, introducing systematic biases which have to be accounted for and um, and that requires data and we're operating in an environment where globally we have a lot of um, livestock populations for which we don't have data on um, the presence of hazards and the impact of those hazards and we still want to be able to say something about losses and disease burden that exists in those systems where we don't know or we don't have a complete picture of cause so um, and that that having then a, a sort of envelope that's that's all cause mortality and morbidity then gives us um, a box that can be divided between um, different uh, hazards or different causes um, as and when data becomes available in a sort of case by case basis. And um, but this then leads us to the question of what is the ideal health situation uh, in human health there's a, a sort of universal um, acceptance that everybody is entitled to a, a long and healthy life but livestock differ in in that respect because um, that their, their purpose is fundamentally economic they're there to transform something less desirable into something more desirable uh, feed and forage and so on into something that we actually value more more and um, and so the the health state and the length of life are under the control of the producer to a greater or lesser extent. Uh, we then need then a, co a conceptual model um, of a livestock system and one that um, I guess reduces uh, the idea of livestock down to the most to, to that most basic um, purpose, which is the conversion of inputs to outputs. So our sort of universal livestock system model would be something like there's a certain amount of inputs are provided to support a, a population which is measured in as kilos of biomass. And those kilos of biomass generate output at a particular rate per kilo. And our measurement would be that, or our hypothesis would be that the performance of that system changes depending on the hazards present um, to which those animals are exposed, to which that biomass is exposed. Um, <clears throat> and in terms of where difference would be measured, then we could expect um, both uh, quant total quantities in and out of the system to change and the rate of transition between each part of that, si that system um, in the presence or absence of hazards. Uh, we, we group hazards into three um, classes that um, affect health, and there would be infectious disease, non-infectious disease, and external forces. Uh, to then transition that conceptual model into a more um, a, a mathematical framework then um, formally uh, we observe in in let me just get that we observe in reality a, a certain um, output of production and we hypothesize that there's a a total potential production that could be produced in that system in their ideal health and this um uh, is a function of the inputs that are provided to that system Z. Now, um, accompanying that, there's a, the presence of certain hazards, pathogens, pests, um, which uh, are, are potentially can be mitigated by certain con pest control or disease control inputs. And the combination of pests and control efforts produces a fraction, a fractional loss to the total potential production, which results in our, our observed yields. 
and um, uh, we have to note then that there's a certain proportion set of inputs that are used um, anyway in the case of even in an ideal health scenario and certain additional inputs that are provided as mitigation against against uh, disease and so the cost of that mitigation activity plus the um, reduction in total product um, total output in some way um, depending on how you want to optimize can be um, the the burden of disease in the system to illustrate with a um, um, concrete example then and we started with um, trying to apply this kind of uh, calculation to um, what could be conceptually the, the most the closest thing to a linear uh, livestock production system which is uh, fattening and broiler chicks from a day old to um, finishing weight and um, and in terms of uh, genetics and environmental exposures and so on perhaps what globally one of the most homogenous kind of um, production systems with a, a, a lower level of extraneous uh, variability to deal with um, and and also a, a system that has a good um, a relatively strong data uh, collection and um, aggregation um, environment already um, <clears throat> so uh, we have um, a, a system where we we know the total production this is the UK from uh, 2020 we know the total output of that system in terms of the meat that's yielded and we know um, the number of chicks that are day old chicks that are placed to go into that system we know the genetic potential well, well we know a expected genetic environmental potential standard for those birds um, and um, from the day old chick placement less chicks slaughtered we can then calculate a mortality rate amongst that population of birds and adjusting for the national um, capacity to produce uh, broiler meat relative to um, the uh, international or the global standard we then can estimate a morbidity rate of lost um, output in that population also so we have a, a combined um, mortality and morbidity uh, loss that's the net uh, of the the total potential production in blue and the actual realized production in green to put this into another from another perspective if we consider it more as a, a cost minimization exercise where we want to produce 1.7 million tons of um, broiler meat on, with the least cost available and to, and to convert this into a um, a burden estimate that that's uh, in a dollar value we can um, quantify the the cost of producing um, this much uh, broiler meat under the current uh, regime and or scenario and the cost of producing the same amount of broiler meat under an ideal health state scenario where this loss doesn't take place so there's no resources wasted supporting this this lost output and in that case we move from a um a cost of production um well we reduce the cost of production per kilo of live weight by approximately 20 cents per kilo and um so largely through um cheaper feed and um and day old chick costs moving into the system and so our burden of disease is the difference in production cost per kilo between uh the ideal health and the um and the current scenario and then to move that um 
to develop that further into a, a model which allows um, dealing with the, the more diverse and more um, complex livestock production systems, which aren't just a single, single kind of uh, one-way process. Uh, we recognize that, that especially ruminant production systems often have a, um, a breeding structure built into them where the, uh, the broiler kind of breeder and, and growing operations are sort of separate enterprises that the, in a ruminant system, you often have um, fertility uh, tied into um, culling rates and the yield of other products as well. Uh, milk, eggs, and wool, and so on. So um, we recognise that in such a state, in such a case, the um, the optimization of the model in the case where you have ideal health involves multiple other parameters, not just the growth rate. And so we um, have to put in some simulation around that. Um, involving growth rate offtake rates and so on and um and that requires a sort of more expanded structural framework and and um we do who's going to present later is going to um give an overview of some work we've done to develop that kind of um more more uh, simulation based modeling on um in uh, the ethiopian context so um that's kind of the the overview as, as in a brief section of how i can give it but um i just want to acknowledge the other people who've contributed to the um animal health loss envelope um method and uh reasoning over the the gbeds um project time frame thanks very much good um I'm giving this on really on behalf. Of, can you go go on behalf of Phil Rasmussen, who developed this um, comorbidity model to as a way to both attributing um, diseases within the health loss envelope and of getting the estimates of the health loss envelope. Um, and this um, comorbidity model um, does them um, together. Okay, next slide then. So, as Will mentioned, the animal loss health loss envelope contains, by definition, the entire burden due to animal health problems, including things like injuries, predation, malnutrition, etc. But some of these contain somewhat potentially difficult to measure components. Um, but a significant proportion of the animal health loss envelope is attributable directly to diseases and health conditions. And there's numerous disease prevalence and impact assessments available and looking at these as a viable starting point. As has already been mentioned, the problem with just adding the impacts of individual diseases together, um, you can end up with double counting, you can end up with the whole impact being more than the um, value of the cattle population or the animal population you're interested in you can end up killing animals more than one, once um, you can and, and and these are all sorts of issues that occur when you just add them together so this was the um, both the idea behind the animal health loss envelope to put a ceiling on the total losses that avoids this problem with double counting and within that then this model then attributes it to um, major diseases Okay, the next slide then. So the potential for overestimate, um, as already mentioned, aggregating or adding disease impacts is likely to overestimate the total burden. And the reasons for this is because the estimates may, the impact estimates may be on single disease studies. And um, these may reflect the economic characteristics of the study region, the inherent biases of the people who are interested in that particular disease. And um, they're also often designed from the prospect of um, control advocacy. And animals may have more than one disease, so you end up with double counting. Um, and the just by adding separate diseases comes to more than the value of the um, actual disease impact. So to reduce the potential for overestimation, we, reduce, we, we are um, 
developed a model by adjusting the impact estimates for statistical associations between diseases um, or comorbidities. Okay, can we have the next slide, please? So why are these important? Why are comorbidities important? It's because impact assessments estimates generate by comparing the productivity of animals with and without disease. For example, if you reduce the, there's a reduced milk yield due to paratuberculosis in dairy cattle, and we can estimate that by comparing milk yield animals with and without paratuberculosis. But paratuberculosis is associated with lameness. Animals with lameness are more likely to have paratuberculosis, and likewise, if they've got paratuberculosis, they're more likely to be lame. And lameness also has an impact on milk yield. So if the probability of lameness is higher in animals with paratuberculosis, then part of the milk yield impact is attributed to paratuberculosis is it actually due to lameness. And um, so the impact estimates are conflations of the impacts of associated diseases. So impacts must be adjusted for comorbidities prior to aggregation to avoid this double counting and overestimate of um, the burden of these, these diseases. Okay, can we have the next slide, please? So we use Bayes' theorem to try and deal with these problems, and this relates to conditional probabilities, such as the probability of disease given the presence of another disease. And we can use this theorem to extract conditional probabilities from prevalence and associate estimates in the literature and allow impact estimates to account for these conditional probabilities. And we now have a disease impact estimates that can be ag aggregated without double counting. And this is not just for two diseases together. We can have any three, four, five diseases or more um, can all be incorporated. So we could have the probability of disease A given probability of disease both B and C. So it's not just a case of having two-way interactions of the disease. And this model uh, that we've developed can deal with all these sorts of in interactions. Okay, can we have the next slide, please? Next slide. Okay, so the pro productivity gaps, and we'll be using the high-income dairy um, cattle. This was used to develop the model um, because it was a, a data-rich environment um, to be able to develop the model, um, this comorbidity model. And the productivity gap includes things like milk yield, fertility, um, rates, mortality, morbidity, etc. And we're looking at the aggregate of adjusted impact estimates used to solve for de disease free or potential disease va free value of that production characteristic. And the pro productivity gap is the difference between the potential and observed values and then the valued dollars or attributed to individual diseases can then be extracted from that, um, from this model, and there, this then can be fed into economic policy, um, economic policy or environmental models, such as consumer, producer welfare, trade, um, greenhouse gas emissions, um, etc. So can we have the next slide, please? So the basic data requirements, we developed this using dairy cattle, um, because as we said, in, in high income countries, because this is where there was a fairly data rich environment and the sort of basic inputs you need for dairy cows is the number of cows, the mean annual production, mean calving interval, mean culling rate, etc. Um, and the prevalence estimates of the various diseases um, and the yield such as the yield, fertility, mortality, impact estimates of those diseases. And then conditional probabilities or prevalence or odds ratios relating to these diseases. Not all the conditional probabilities are available, but we can still model that um, by um, um, through um, uh, what's it called through through various Monte Carlo methods to see how um, um, they can impact using various different assumptions. So can we have the next slide, please? We tested the, the approach using an example of the dairy cattle system based on the UK. We started off with 13 diseases and health conditions and uh, know from experience that most of 
a relatively small number of diseases cause most of the health impact issues and compared the different uh, three potential methods of aggregation between the different uh, levels and adjusting for co comorbidities reduced estimates burdens by between 15 to 65 percent and this we published in the um, preventative veterinary medicine which gives um, details um, of the model next slide please and uh, then we're now rolling this out to other livestock systems and regions, um, which includes systematic reviews and meta-analysis of ongo ongoing to populate models according to GBADS livestock classifications. Um, we've looked at the prevalence and impact of diseases in global dairy cattle, firstly at the high, uh, the high income, um, high uh, upper income countries. We're also looking at the prevalence and impact of cattle diseases in Ethiopia and the prevalence of impact of diseases in global um, small scale poultry. And the next step is to review and analyze the frequency duration data for epidemic outbreaks and gen generate so called expected prevalence values. And for things like epidemic outbreaks that may occur once every few years, then you there's a approach that you could just model it for the disease the out, when the outbreak occurs or by the mean probability based on the number of um, the, the frequency of outbreaks over time. And the same approach can be used for things like floods, droughts, etc. that can have a major impact on um, the um, on animal productivity. So we share next slide please. So this is um, close to finishing with the ongoing global dairy analysis based on um, the systems in 40 high income dairy producing regions based on the fact that in high income countries they're more or less similar sorts of um, um, systems in high income dairies and this was this was aggregated across all regions modeled and based on this we estimated to be approximately 25 billion United States dollars per year and you can see the main sorts of diseases that um, finding lameness was clearly the um, largest impact um, resulting in about $6.6 .6 billion, followed by mastitis, and then going all the way down things like dystocia and milk fever um, at the um, lower end of the um, estimates. Uh, next slide, please. And this um, 25 billion is a lower estimate of the animal health loss envelope for the um, for dairy for um, dairy systems in upper income countries, and also we can look at it for multiple regions and analyse within the same methodological framework. We can look at it in different ways. Um, in for, uh, like, if we look at the national burden in terms of um, US dollars per year, the USA has the highest um, burden of um, disease in dairy cattle um, of the of, of these high income countries. But of course that. That's only gives you part of the um, story because the USA is um, also has one of the is one of the biggest producers. It's a large country. It's a wealthy country. It has a lot of dairy cattle. A more um, nuanced way of looking at it is things like burden per capita. And here we see that. Um, countries like New Zealand or Ireland um, are starting to um, have a high, much higher relative impact, whilst the um, um, United States disappears into a re relatively small box. And this is because New Zealand and Ireland are small countries with very large populations of dairy cattle. Um, you could, and, and the similar sorts of thing with burden as percentage of GDP. At again, New Zealand has a it has a very high impact. Ireland less so because of there's a um, it, it, there are other important industries other than the cattle industry. Um, and then when you're looking at things like um, burden as percentage of farm gate revenue or bird, particularly burden for animal, it tends to be less variable. And, and this probably reflects um, the variation, probably reflects the local um, incidences of these diseases um, together with the local um, valuation of the livestock products. Okay, so next slide, please. 
And then we can use things like sensitivity analysis to identify gaps and guide research. And this we can look at um, different interactions um, of the disease impacts to see um, to try and find out um, where we might need to find more um, information or whether we actually need that information and it can capture the uncertainty around model inputs and outputs and help to identify key parameters and variables and assumptions etc and it's critical for applications in data scarce region um, which is where we are heading next um, with um, this model. Okay, should we have the next slide, please? So, in conclusion, the model allows us to aggregate to these disease impact estimates without double counting, and our estimates are, um, are far short of the total value of livestock in the countries we've had. It's also um, um, is, is, is less than the value of the outputs, so we're fairly um, we're, we're fairly confident that it avoids that. It's a flexible data-driven approach that can be applied to various livestock systems across the regions, and it estimates and attribute disease burden to to lower um, and gives a lower bound to the animal health loss envelope. I mean, again, coming back to this double counting, I think for the United Kingdom dairy. Um, um, systems we're looking at a gross margin of about two thousand um, pounds per cow per year and the when we aggregated the disease impacts it came to about 500 um, and so that also illustrates this avoidance of the double counting guides policy it compares multiple regions diseases livestock systems within consistent methodological frameworks it identifies the most burdensome diseases and burden regions and identifies the most um, uh, uh, accurate measures of burden and informs control or abatement strategies and improves animal welfare support um, etc it also helps us to guide research to identify knowledge gaps and empirically assess the impacts of our assumptions and estimates can be fed into other economic policy um, and environmental models of course if you get rid of um, disease you're going to have an impact on the um, number of animals you need for the um, for the same output and um, but these can be modeled um, uh, uh, um, directly from the results of the models or the the estimates we get from these this this model okay i think that's it yes Um, thank you, everybody. We will now we have now concluded our first um, section of our session, and um, I will now um, just bring it up for any questions you may all have, and also to ask um, Vanessa to help us with the Mentipool, putting up the first Mentipool. So please go ahead and either on your another browser or by your phone, enter in the email address here for this Mentipool, as well as the code that you see up in the screen. And if you can help us, um, this is the question. We want the first question, Vanessa, the one on. Um... Yes, the first one. So I will just like to ask you all in this mentee poll to help us understand. I mean, based on, on what you have heard, do you have access to data or connections to groups that might have data that is of use to the three topics that were just covered? I know that I had mentioned about a study and whether you had any contacts you can give us in those case studies, but also of the different um, aspects we've spoken about, whether you have access to any data or connections that you think might be beneficial based upon the three topics presented. So I'll go ahead and um, allow you all to enter information into the Mentipole. And also, this is an opportunity. You can also use the link that Vanessa has just put up. And this is also an opportunity for anybody who would like to ask some questions um, to the presenters. And I see that uh, several of you have already included some questions and you've gotten some responses. But I will let um, you all, if, is there anybody who has any questions? Okay, I see we got one response from um, from um, someone. 
Can you all hear me all right? Yes, we can hear you, Edna. Okay, wonderful. We have an opportunity for one question before we move on to the next presentation. Please put your name on the menti on the menti poll on where you are, what organization you're representing. Okay, we'll just maybe give it another minute. I see there's an active discussion going on in the chat as well. Okay, somebody has responded that you have diagnostic surveillance systems which could be integrated to provide live prevalence maps in the long term. May I know who was the who was the individual who included this within the Mentipool? I think that's fantastic. Gareth, I see you've put in a question about whether GBADs have any decision makers involved in the process at this early stage. If so, uh, who are they? So we have several, we are, as we develop in this program, as we develop in this approach, we are interacting and getting inputs from several different groups of stakeholders. So we get an input from stakeholders in the development community. We get an input from stakeholders. Um, we have interactions with the private sector. We also have an interactions with um, WOHA members, which are WOHA members consists of CVOs and um, also other partners we have presented in um, regional conferences and we've gotten feedback and inputs into what are some of those aspects that some of these end users would like to see us capture within the program. We also do have an um, have it planned to develop an end users group. So as we develop this approach and we um, come up with these estimates and we develop our various tools that we have, we are gonna have a users uh, end users group as well that's gonna provide us with a lot of um, inputs. We also had a presentation at ESV and we also had an opportunity to also get inputs from stakeholders within the scientific research and academic, academic world as well. And Dai has also mentioned in the chat of our close interaction with um, stakeholders with in Indonesia, in the public sector. And also I see Megan has also answered it as well. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, I see that Sebi will be keen to support some of the data extractions from literature and we are already collaborating. That is true, it's been a really great collaboration with Sebi, so we're very thankful about that. Simon, we will definitely be getting in touch with you concerning what you've mentioned. So I think we can go ahead and close this um, discussion session and go to the next presentation on our list. And that's from David. Please continue adding your various questions in the chat. Hello everyone. And thanks for um, taking the time to listen to myself and my colleagues uh, in, this, in this session today. Just like everyone else, I'm presenting on behalf of multiple people um, and our group represents the human health theme where we're trying to work towards quantifying the impact of the poor livestock health outcomes that have been described in the presentations prior on on human health and 
originally a, a, a large group of us come from a number of human health burden of disease exercises, such as the global burden of disease that's done by the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation, and also um, the WHO group that worked on estimating the burden of disease attributable to unsafe food that um, Brecht of Leishauer, my co-PI on, on the human health theme, um, contributed to. And so originally, a lot of our thought was thinking about the direct impacts of those, of those pathogens. So thinking about brucellosis as an economic impact associated with the production losses as a consequence of premature mortality and ongoing morbidity with an accompanying metric of human health loss. And we typically use this, this metric called the disability adjusted life year, which is a, a composite of years of life loss due to premature mortality, due to people dying before the, the estimated life expectancy, and years live with disability. So how long are people suffering poor health of varying magnitudes um, on, on a day-to-day, year-to-year basis? And one of the things that we really wanted to consider first and foremost was, do current representations of zoonotic disease align with global priorities and what we already understand on some of these, of these pathogens? So we undertook a, a review of a variety of prioritization exercises. And on the left of the, the two plots that you can see on the right of this slide, is a rank order of how often those pathogens came up. And then on the right hand side is how many burden of disease exercises that um, we, we just uh, encountered, whether that was globally or with local exercises. And so some like brucellosis and rabies are considered uh, more frequently than others on burden of disease exercises, but there were some pathogens that were being clearly and repeatedly signaled as an important local health priority, like anthrax or plague, that weren't being considered within those um, burn of disease exercises. And there were others, such as campylobacteriosis, that were overrepresented, most likely due to the fact that they're also contributing to a multitude of other um, clusters of health problems, like diarrheal disease and things like that. Nevertheless, when we looked at these piecemeal estimates of uh, zoonotic disease burden, we were uncovering a considerable amount of disability adjusted life years being estimated, even excluding those pathogens that we thought were critical. One of the other bits that we wanted to look at was what is the state of the art of evidence? And so even when with brucellosis, that was one of the better represented pathogens in those burn of disease systems, we saw large global discrepancies between some of the key parameters that went into those models. So on the, on the top right here, you're looking at a duration parameter and different groups were saying that a brucellosis infection spans from either three weeks all the way to four and a half years in terms of negative health consequences. And so that will have a huge impact as to what the overall years live with disability is going to look like. The other pathogens like neurocystisocosis, it was more a problem of how is that, uh, how is that being estimated? That more available data on a different feature of that, so in this case epilepsy, was being used to back calculate cystosarcosis numbers uh, rather than going forward from cystosarcosis data, building it up, and then that contributing to an epilepsy data set. So whilst there's quite a lot of information on some of these key metrics like prevalence or incidence or, or deaths, we find that some of the Subparameters that are essential for calculating a disability adjusted life year. So things like duration or what are the health states, what are the categorizations of, of illness that individuals subsequently um, are affected by once infected by these pathogens really tended to, to vary wildly. And as a consequence, our DALI numbers are going to change considerably just purely due to how we're calculating it rather than anything that's 
truly reflective of the changes and differences inherent with those epidemiological statistics. Um, some of these are just pure value judgments or are based on very limited data sets. And we want to try and uh, encourage more investigation onto those topics. And then with mortality data, there's a profound disconnect that's repeated across many different causes of the most affected, uh, the most impacted countries are those that have the have the the youngest or most absent civil and vital registration systems that are essential for reliably understanding what is the consequences uh, in terms of mortality of these pathogens. Now, as part of the Global Burn of Animal Disease team, it's really broadened our, our horizons in terms of the total impacts of um, animal diseases on human health. And whilst we initially focused on some of these direct impacts, others within the team were really challenging us to think about the broader impacts and some of the indirect consequences of livestock. And this is our attempt to try and begin to start mapping out the total impact space, as it were, and then look through the opportunities to quantify various bits and pieces of, of this. And so I'm, I've shown you some of the direct bits that's in the central part, but I'm going to look at antimicrobial resistance and some of the nutritional pathways uh, to, to discuss more broadly how we're going to think through some of the indirect impacts of, of poor animal health. Now with antimicrobial resistance, there's been a lot of work both in human domains and animal domains to understand what's going on in terms of antimicrobial resistance evolution and prevalence. But one of the key bits that's missing is trying to quantify the linkage between those two systems. How much of human burden of disease can be attributed to animal burden of disease? And then naturally there's some disconnects in terms of data systems that exist covering those topics and the relative priorities of what's going on. So we first set out to look through like what was the one health definition of antimicrobial resistance and looking at mutual priorities between animals and humans and went about looking at the currently available data to, to demonstrate that in some countries we have a much better idea globally of what's going on and then in other places there are far more gaps. We're, we're totally right, flying blind in terms of certain bug, drug, and uh, animal system combinations in terms of uh, what's the current prevalence of, of these conditions. And then we align those data with um, human animal antimicrobial, sorry, human antimicrobial resistance estimates to try and give one additional perspective to the consequences of those gaps, that there are some places where humans are severely impacted, that we've not got a corresponding and commensurate animal surveillance system in place to help understand the livestock contribution. And whilst that, that topic is fairly nascent in what's going on, one of the bits that we wanted to explore was just that correlative relationship between animal prevalence and human prevalence of disease in order to try and help filter down what are the bug drug combinations that are most likely to, um, to represent a direct linkage and where are the places that we're most likely to find that relationship should we uh, undertake the necessary activities. And so our team are currently working to try and understand who has set out to quantify those linkages and what is replicable and repeatable elsewhere in the world with this lens of which communities would be the, the best to focus our currently limited resources on this topic. And then finally, thinking through um, the nutritional pathways through which poor animal health loss so uh, could, could impact humans. And so here we're trying to think about some of those differentials that um, Will was talking about that those 287,000 tons of broiler production, for instance, that um, uh, didn't, didn't, um, were not achieved. And then translating those into commodities and then diet, and then thinking about the, the impacts that those changes, that those hypothetical changes in diet could be translated to. 
And so um, here we've outlined that there are a, a couple of studies at the bottom in purple that span various sections of this piece, but there isn't at the minute a framework that goes from animal health loss all the way through to human health loss. And so here we need to better understand the different composition of, of um, food elements. So breaking those down into various macro and micronutrients. And then finally, we can leverage work by the global burden of disease, for instance, to translate consumption of macro and micronutrients into relative risks for all cause mortality, for instance, or various types of um, specific disease systems and things. So with an eye to the time, uh, I think I'd, I think now's a great opportunity for my colleague Dustin to talk about some of the economic impacts uh, that he and his colleagues have been working on. All right, thank you, David. I'll share my screen. All right. Uh, so my name's David Mitchum. My name's Dustin Pendle. I'm a, a agricultural economist at Kansas State University, and you can see there's a, a several other co-authors who are either who are all ag economists at Washington State University or at Kansas State University. And so today we're going to talk about the wider economic impacts of animal health. Uh, so here's just a way to think about the economic framework that we're going to be talking about, kind of looking at the this economic values of the wider economic impacts. We can use some partial equilibrium models to look at maybe some of the impacts to producers and consumers uh, throughout the ag supply chain. Uh, we could use some kind of input output matrix to account for the impacts to you know the non ag sectors such as travel, tourism, food, lodging, etc. We can also take a look at the impacts to the government, whether it's quarantine, surveillance, vaccination expenditures. Uh, et cetera, through various budgeting techniques. And then as mentioned earlier in Dai's presentation, you know, we can very carefully uh, make sure that we can add these up to kind of come up with total, total economic impacts uh, without double counting. Dustin, Dustin, may I please, sorry. Yes. May I please ask you to please share in presenter mode because right now it's quite small. I'm not sure if you can see the slides. Oh, did I pick the wrong? screen Let's if you see. can't i will be happy to share it on your behalf oh sorry wrong screen okay wonderful thank you very much dustin is that you guys can see it better yes yeah all right and so then for this particular uh this theme the wire economics we're going to use two different models we're going to use both the partial equilibrium model and a, and a general equilibrium model. we'll talk a little bit about why here uh shortly but you can just kind of see the differences uh, between these two models, where the general equilibrium, we're really talking about this, this income at the bottom here. We're, we're incorporating income back into this. So we're doing two case studies, as already mentioned. One is going to be Ethiopia, and just a little bit about the situation here in Ethiopia. And, and you'll hear more about the Ethiopia uh, case study here in a little bit, but you can see we're looking at, uh, in, in 2020, we had a human population of about 115 million focusing on small ruminants, both sheep and goats. Uh, we are gonna use both the partial equilibrium and a general equilibrium model just to compare the results across the two models, frameworks. But we are looking at a GE or general equilibrium framework because agriculture is so embedded within the total or the, the, the wider economy. And so ag output is actually 40% of the gross domestic product. And so that's why we're gonna be looking at a, using the CG model. Uh, you can see where our data comes from, both trying to think about the prices and quantities and how we calculate our welfare uh, measures. Uh, and then just some of the descriptive statistics kind of on the right hand side there of the screen, just so you can kind of see maybe if you want to think about compare some of the some of our preliminary results here on the here coming up. Uh, we are for this presentation, we just got some hypothetical shocks, but we'll talk about later where they're coming from. Uh, as I mentioned, we are using both partial equilibrium and, a, and a, a general equilibrium model. We have had to estimate all the elasticities from the data that we talked about on the last slides, on the last previous slide. Uh, our hypothetical shocks, we can come either from a demand 
perspective, if consumers were to change their demand, uh, we can come from the supply side, which would be uh, from the GBADs. They can, you know, the animal health loss envelope group that discussed earlier, Will and his group. Uh, and then we also look about, we can think about exports, uh, you know, having an impact on the economy as well. And so then in the next slide, your next couple of slides, you're going to see, or next slide, you're going to see results from both models of partial equilibrium and our general equilibrium. One's going to be in blue, the, the partial equilibrium and our orange, the results in orange will be from the general equilibrium model. And you can see here, these are just an illustrative, just to kind of give you an idea of what we're thinking about or what we're doing. Uh, the, the figure on the left would be our changes in welfare measures to consumers. Uh, on the right, the figure on the right would be our changes in uh, producers surplus measures. Uh, the two things I want to point out here is as we have a, a larger change in supply, so think maybe more animals from a morbidity and mortality standpoint, as you go from left to right on your x-axis, you'll notice those two models, the results get uh, are different or they're becoming wider. The other comment we want to make is if you look at the consumers the figure on the left versus the producers, uh, the impacts to them, one on the right, you'll notice the impacts to the consumers are much larger than compared to the impacts uh, on the producers. So it's, as we think about if we can reduce mortality, we can remove, reduce morbidity, the impact's going to be felt much larger to the consumers than it would be on the producer side. And so that's just one thing to think about or keep in mind as, uh, as we go through here. We're doing a second case study uh, looking at the broiler industry here in the United States uh, because agriculture is a very small uh, part of the GDP uh, in the U.S. I believe it's about 0.6% of GDP here in the U.S. We're actually going to use a partial equilibrium model. Uh, we're going to look at all livestock and meat markets incorporated into this model. And similar to the previous, to the Ethiopian case study, we're going to take the the, the output from the animal health loss envelope, and we're going to incorporate that into our framework. Uh, and then what the model, this partial equilibrium model is going to give us, what's going to report is uh, consumer welfare, consumer surplus measures. And we can do that out by the broiler industry. We could look at it by, you know, beef, pork, et cetera. Uh, we're also going to look at producer surplus from the broilers producers, but we can also look at from the beef uh, uh, from the pork, sheep and goats, et cetera. So we can we can break that out by species if we want. Uh, here's the case study, just again, some descriptive statistics for those that are interested. We uh, in, specifically were looking at the year 2015 because back in 2015, we had a, a, a high path avian influenza outbreak. And so we wanted to take a look at that particular year. Uh, you can see just some of the production and the exports here in the US. Uh, and as I mentioned, we are going to use a partial equilibrium model here, primarily because ag output is such a small component of our gross domestic product. So when we run our partial equilibrium model, this is just an example of some output, some results, uh, some welfare measures, consumer producer welfare measures. On your vertical axis will be the dollar amounts in millions of dollars. Uh, on your x-axis are just five or six four or five different scenarios we just came up with uh, just to give you a flavor of the types of results that we can get. And we can break this out by broiler uh, consumers who consume broiler meat versus consumers who consume other meats, red meat products. Uh, we can break it out from the producer standpoint, looking at those produ broiler producers, welfare measures versus uh, the other red meat producer impacts. Additionally, we can break this out uh, along the supply chain. And so that's one thing that we're looking at. One thing that we like about this is it allows us to look at the supply chain. So it's not only just the farmers or the farm level uh, producers that are being impacted. There are impacts throughout the entire supply chain going from the farmer all the way to the final consumer. And so that's another thing that we like about these models that will uh, be able to shed some light about who's being impacted uh, along that supply chain. And then finally, uh, last slide here, just kind of our next steps. Uh, 
what we're going to do, we just made some hypothetical scenarios, hypothetical shocks to demonstrate what our models can do and what kind of the outputs we'll get. We're actually going to use the output from the animal health loss envelope to incorporate into our modeling efforts. Uh, and so that's part of it. Then we're going to work with the attribution team and we're going to try to attribute out uh, at those impacts that we saw in the previous couple slides. And then finally, we're going to use this information uh, to help guide uh, from an efficiency standpoint and an equity standpoint, help guide uh, investments into this animal health space. And with that, uh, I think my show, my time is up. And so I will turn it over to our next speaker. Okay, thank you very much, Edna and Megan. I'm sure you'll be back with us in a minute. Uh, my name is Teresa Bernardo. I'm a veterinary epidemiologist who works in health informatics at the University of Guelph. And I co-lead the informatics theme with my colleague, Deb Stacey from Computer Science. <clears throat> Just have to do a little moving around here. Okay, so the three takeaways for the informatics theme are that we have a competent, collaborative, and adaptive team. We are co-creating various data products like dashboards for components of the GBADS calculation. And we're working towards verifiable data that is automatically updated. And we're documenting our processes in terms of best practices and selected tools. In 2019, we held an international expert consultation with a mix of veterinarians, epidemiologists, computer and data scientists, who helped devise a five-year operational plan, which we are, our team is now executing, starting with a report on best practices from similar initiatives, which is now well underway. Much of our effort has focused on the landscape, of, sorry, much of our effort has focused on our second output, uh, mapping the landscape of existing data, including data quality and terms of access. We've also begun to cultivate a community of internal and external GBADS collaborators and users, with whom we are designing and co-creating a suite of knowledge products and services, which constitute our knowledge engine. The GBADS calculation, as you've seen, starts with what you would expect to be a simple measure, the number of animals by species. We started with open sources of data from international organizations like WOA and FAO, but how do you reconcile the number of cattle when every database categorizes them differently? We're working on ontologies and graph databases to deal with this issue. Visualizing the data can also point out likely data errors. Using our dashboard to look at the global population of several species over time showed a problem with the number of swine in 2013, which you can clearly see here, and has since been corrected. We're on the road to reproducibility, documenting where data has come from and what has been done to it, developing measures of data quality to build trust in the data itself, as well as the resulting models and dashboards. We're also incorporating best practices and standards, which we're documenting in our data governance handbook. Each output serves as an input for additional calculations. Once we have an accurate estimate of livestock numbers, it can be combined with estimates of biomass to calculate the economic investment in animals and infrastructure. But the impact of these calculations goes beyond GBADS, Biomass is also used to calculate estimates of antimicrobial use and biomass factors into climate change. So any errors along the way can be amplified in subsequent calculations. Thus, GBED's data factor into sustainable development goals, including hunger, health, responsible production, climate action, and livelihoods. These are some of the great people we get to work with and the URL for our dashboards. If you'd like to have a look at them, we'd love to have your feedback. Deb Stacy, my partner from computer science, has recruited an unending stream of talented postdocs, graduate, and undergraduate students to work with us. According to Bill Gates, one of COVID's chief lessons about modeling is the need for good data and just how hard it can be to get that data. Next, Deb will provide more technical data details about our data journey. <clears throat> Sharing there and let Deb share her screen. Okay. Uh, let me get that up here and <clears throat> all right is everybody seeing my presentation yes okay great okay um 
the GBATS informatics theme is all about supporting the modelers and decision makers by locating, evaluating, analyzing, and managing the data and processes necessary for calculating the burden of animal diseases. We have developed a set of tools in a data repository and have made these available through our knowledge engine and data portal, gbadske.org. Okay. We faced various challenges when we started our mission, and they have helped to shape our approaches. The first challenge is just finding the appropriate data for our tasks. There are limited sources at the global level, and national data can be hard to find, non-existent, and or hard to use. We strive to follow the fair data principles of findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. We also have to acknowledge that most data are collected and presented with a country-centric viewpoint, which thus defines, defines context. And I think there was a question about this on uh, the chat. Multiple data sources that claim to represent the same thing often differ, and this phenomena is rarely acknowledged or studied in depth. All data should be accompanied by high-quality metadata, hopefully in a machine-processable form. Without metadata and provenance, there is a risk of misunderstanding what the data represents and its limitations. Given all these challenges we developed and are still developing, it's an iterative process, a set of approaches. We have studied many different sources of livestock data at the global and national level. We have created tools to allow access to these data sources through, an, through a GBADS API that delivers data from GBADS databases or directly from external APIs. In the case of the external APIs, the responses to queries are filtered by us to provide a common exchange format with things like units, country names, et cetera, for all the data. We are also taking the long view and analyzing the longitudinal structure of all data sources and using the analysis to help in our understanding of the semantic interoperability of data. In other words, how can we interpret the meaning of data from different data sources? In other words, what is a bird or cattle? What is included and what is not? Can we map data from different data sources to uh, other ones for comparison and evaluation purposes? We want to understand the data so that our modelers can understand the impact of the data that they choose for their models. As an example, look at this comparison of dairy cattle numbers in CSO, an Irish national data source, ICAR, an NGO setting global livestock production, uh, particularly dairy, and BOA. While all the sources report the same population numbers in 2017, they're not equal in 2018, and in 2019, the CSO and BOA report the same numbers, but ICAR does not. Again, this shows there are issues in data consistency and in the semantics of category. I will briefly review all the tools that we have developed and those that are currently being developed. Our main tool for visualizing data is the dashboard. We have developed ones around some basic data like population and biomass and are actively working with GBADS themes to create others. Here you can see the basic framework for one of our dashboards displaying the number of animals per species by country over a select range of years from one of multiple data sets available. Here we have four tabs, a graph for visualization, maps, data table where users can inspect and download data, and metadata. We have a set of dashboard tools that allow us to train developers quickly in the creation of dashboards. We are constantly updating the dashboards to add more features and to improve their usability and aesthetics. Sometimes a dashboard's not the preferred display model. So we, have also, uh, we are also developing reports and data stories. Our reports help to find inconsistencies within and between data sources. And our data stories help to add a narrative to what the data is telling us. Our first data story uses data scraped from livestock reports from the Ethiopian Central Statistical Agency. This digital form of the data is available only from GBADS. We have visualized the vaccination data to look for trends and interesting events. Here we see an upward trend in the percentage of cattle vaccinated against various diseases until 2017, when there is a drop. Could this be related to the uh, impact of armed conflicts or climate change? And interestingly, we see the same trend in vaccination for other species. Here we see the vaccination rates for camels and see that this, see that same decline after 2017. But in examining the y-axis, we can see that the rate of vaccination is at most 10% as opposed to the cattle high of over 60%. And the low rate of vaccination is consistent with information in the literature about camels, such as in the, pa in the paper, how many large camelids in the world. 
That paper also suggested that the number of camels is largely unknown and reported numbers can change drastically depending on if there is an animal census. Here we show the data from two different sources for camel numbers, Faustat and the Ethiopian CSA, and observe the abnormality of the 2019-2020 numbers from the CSA. Dissemination of data and model outputs is extremely important, and we have created a portal to inform and direct users to our data products. The entry to our system is through gbadske.org. It will take you to the API, dashboards, and documentation. Our documentation site is driven by DocuSaurus and is located at gbadsk.doc.org and organizes our publications, manuals, handbooks, tutorials, and videos. And not only is it in English, it is also automatically being translated into French and Spanish to adhere to the three official languages of war. We are doing these translations automatically, but are making adjustments when human, French, and Spanish speakers alert us to a problem. We organize all our code in GitHub and have a Dayton's governance handbook explaining the best practices that we are attempting to institute in our work, which is available on the documentation site. We have collected and cleaned data that we then manage in cloud-based database tables, all of which are accessible through our GBADS API. The a API makes it easy to compare data from different data sources as demonstrated by these API calls that show the difference in camel population counts in Morocco from two different data sources. This is represents an overview of our data flow. We take data acquired from different data sources using a collection of methods and store them or their API information in the GBADS data store. This data is used in models, and these models produce data that, are, that is also stored by GBADS. All code to use and produce data is stored in our GitHub repo, and this data flow is informed by our graph database models. Metadata is at the heart of our transparent, accountable, fair system. Technologies used to aid in mapping vocabularies and concepts include graph databases, such as Neo4j, and ontologies in, conjunct in conjunction with the work being done by the GBAS ontology theme. We're using graphs to map relationships within and between data sources so that we do not have to rely on various standards to use data sources together. To summarize, we have made progress towards our goals. We're not just providing data and running statistics. We strive to understand and thoroughly document the existing data and thus to see the data gaps in conjunction with our colleagues in the other themes. Together, we can increase the usefulness of the existing and potential future data for users of the GBADS Knowledge Engine and Data Portal to evaluate the global burden of animal diseases. And thank you for your attention. And hopefully, we can uh, get Megan in here to explain the uh, ontologies, because we work very closely with that theme. Thank you, Megan. Thanks, Please go Deb. ahead. <laughs> Sorry about all the internet issues. I'm going to just jump straight in and I'll leave my video off. So hopefully that works now. So um, linking with Dyer's presentation on livestock populations and uh, Will's work on the animal health loss envelope, um, we then jumped into looking at um, how we use comorbidity for attribution. And now just coming back to how we attribute um, to specific diseases um, for this animal health loss envelope. So the animal health ontology theme started with the discovery that we do not have international standard for classifying diseases. And further, that there are many ways to classify disease, for example, by severity, by anatom anatomical location, and by undertake or by underlying mechanism the cause such as the pathogen or a traumatic event for example. This then extends to the requirement that we need some standards across all of the terms that we use from the different themes we have in GBADS. Thus this classification theme that we decided on for GBADS became an ontology. The Animal Health Ontology, which was initiated by Fernanda and Crawford, who are part of the LD4D Ontology Community of Practice, 
They developed an ontology for animal health surveillance, and we were building on this uh, for one that's specific to GBADS and takes a data-driven approach. Based on this overarching framework, any relevant terms and their associated properties and attributes are identified in data sets and reports, as explained earlier by Teresa and Deb. For example, an infectious disease has a host, which has specific properties, so species, breed, type, and age. And if we take this, the disease also has an effect on the input and output of production systems. So this ontology creates a mach uh, this material in a machine readable format. And I'll just demonstrate one way that we can use this ontology. We can use it uh, for data mapping and query. And one of the uses is the annotation of reports, publications, and data sets. So we can add tags for the cause of animal health loss. In this example, we're tagging the foot and mouth disease virus, which is in this uh, abstract from a paper. We can then look at the types of losses here. So we are looking at uh, mortality in cattle, milk loss, and draft power loss. We can look at expenditure and disease control, and we can look at the population and tagging and annotating those populations. So here we have commercial dairy production and crop mixed livestock systems um, for cattle, sheep, and goats. Finally, we can look at disease frequency. So tagging here, 68.1% in that mixed crop livestock production system. And then, we can use all of those types of data and use them to help us attribute the animal health loss envelope that was described earlier by Will and illustrated on this slide. Here we have a box which we call the envelope. This will help us to demonstrate the utility of the ontologies that we're developing. Um, I mentioned Lee in the first slide, which we may have missed, but he is helping with the ontology for the animal production systems and populations. And Stephen Kwok is developing one for the disease component of the GBADS program. So our first level of attribution is into three broad groups. We have what we call cause specific um, at these various levels of aggregation. And starting with level one, we have infectious causes, non-infectious causes, and what we call external causes. Later in the session, uh, Wudu will re re uh, present the methodology we used to attribute the envelope, envelope into these three broad categories. But for now, just a quick taster of the results from the Ethiopian small ruminant study. So here we can see that production loss accounted for 76% of the total animal health loss. And when we attribute this to level one causes, the infectious, non-infectious and external causes, for adult, adult females in both production systems, a cropped mixed livestock and the pastoral systems. Uh, the infectious diseases made up 21% of the total losses. Non-infectious diseases, 13.5 and external causes, 10.7. And we can attribute the mortality and the morbidity for each of these age sex categories in a similar way. To dig deeper into attribution, we can then use a bottom up approach starting at level three. These are the cause specific. And if necessary, level four, we have disease variation such as severity or different serotypes of a pathogen. Rather than make a list of all possible diseases and injuries, we start with those that we have some data for. So we're building on the systematic maps for the infectious diseases that were generated by the amazing team at SEBI, and we conduct systematic reviews to identify any disease or injury. So not only infectious, but our non-infectious and external causes. Anything that has a measure of disease frequency, so in this case for sheep and goats in Ethiopia, we can start to build what we call outcome trees. 
This is a similar approach to one that is used for the Global Burden of Disease Study for Humans. We use pathophysiology to map the causes to animal health loss. So for example, mortality, changes in fertility, reduction in growth rate. And again, using systematic reviews to estimate the proportion of the population affected and the proportion of the affected population that have each outcome. As you can imagine, this is a very time consuming process. And as demonstrated earlier, the animal health ontology is used to annotate their reports and publications and any relevant primary data sets. As we progress, this process becomes more automated and faster. So over time, um, we add new data as it becomes available. So it's also a dynamic process and increasing the precision with which we can estimate these specific causes. We can also use the relationships between the concepts and terms in the ontology to integrate data from different sources. So just to demonstrate that not all values need to come from one source as was demonstrated by Deb and Teresa earlier. Once we have the frequencies of specific causes and the probabilities of each outcome from the outcome tree, we can add them together, attributing lamb mortality to specific causes such as pregnancy toxemia, dystocia, predation, gastrointestinal parasites. Note too that we can attribute the animal health loss envelope to infectious diseases that are not actually present in a particular country or region, as there is expenditure on keeping those diseases out. I always use the example of, of Australia, where at present we do not have foot and mouth disease, but we spend uh, quite a bit of our animal health budget on making sure that it stays outside our borders. However, if we merely add all those individual diseases up, it is likely that the total lamb mortality will be more than the animal health loss envelope. We're spilling out of that envelope. Therefore, linking back with what Paul was presenting earlier, we use our comorbidity models that um, these absolute values of the level one attribution categories, and we can make sure that we squeeze those losses calculated for level three causes associated with each of the three broad categories for adult females in Ethiopian crop mixed livestock systems. And this helps to constrain those individual diseases and injuries so they're not spilling out of our animal health source envelope. Again, this is an iterative process that is improved over time as we integrate more data and strengthen those comorbidity models. Thank you for listening. I do hope that my Internet survived the three, the 10 minutes. Um, and I just want to acknowledge all those wonderful people that we've worked with to get to this stage. Um, and not only within GBADS, but the work of the people at SABI, SABI um, that we've been working with for the, the ontologies. Thank you so much, Megan. We'll go straight to the presentation from Wudu. We are running a bit out of time, so um, but we will try to make sure we are done by 5 p.m. And I'll put in the chat links for you to get in touch with us um, if you have any questions following this presentation. There's also a brain date right after. So go ahead, Wudu. Okay, uh, I'm sharing my, my screen. Uh, and. Uh... Sending it into presentation. Yeah. Okay, can you see my screen? Perfect. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Udo Tamaskan, and uh, I'm working for uh, Livestock uh, International Livestock Research Institute, and uh, I'm veterinary epidemiology and I'm a health economist. And um, uh, in this presentation, just uh, you have seen the GBARS analytical structure that is uh, presented by speakers before me. And in this presentation, I'm going to uh, talk how this analytical structure is applied to a case study, uh, a case of Ethiopia. And this is a GBARS analytical structure that we have seen in the previous talks. And uh, we applied this GBARS analytical structure into different species in Ethiopia, including um, camel, chicken, horse, uh, 
cattle and small mammals. And actually, these different species are at different stage of progression along this analytical pathway. And uh, uh, small mammals is the most advanced. And uh, I will use uh, small mammals as a work example for this presentation. And the first uh, step in this analytical structure is the estimation of the population and the classification of the production system. And uh, we classified the small mammal population in Ethiopia into three major production systems, two of which is a major one are presented here in the top right map. Uh, the green representing the crop livestock system and the yellow the pastoral system. Actually, this classification is based on the agroecology and the set production system is a specialized system. And the two major production systems are further classified into a crop livestock system and uh, I mean, the crop livestock system and the pastoral systems are further classified into four systems uh, based on the feeding type and uh, it's presented in the bottom right map. And this table shows the distribution of the population along these different production systems. And overall, the small land population in Ethiopia in 2021 estimated about 95.5 uh, million. Uh, and the next stop was just to estimate the biomass and economic value. and uh, the estimation of the biomass is using a, a herd dynamic model. This is a, a compartmental model following the life, uh, the life cycle process of uh, animals. And this model is uh, parameterized by demographic rates such as mortality and reproduction rate and also optics. So uh, based on these parameters, uh, it shows how the, the herd evolves and we use this model for uh, biomass and economic value estimation. The biomass was uh, estimated uh, using the method that I described as tier three, that is based on uh, local data, uh, which has uh, the live weight for uh, each class of animals. So we calculated the biomass as the number of animals in each sex category times their respective weights. And uh, we calculate the stock economic value again by the number of animals in each sex age category that's produced by the model times uh, their corresponding market price. And the production economic value uh, was calculated as the volume of uh, uh, products, including live animals, in terms of uh, of take and hard growth, and also other products like milk heads and dung, and uh, multiplied by their corresponding prices. And uh, here are the uh, results of the biomass and economic value uh, calculations. As you can see here, the biomass was estimated about 2.2 billion kilograms uh, for small plants in Ethiopia. This is in 2021. And the financial value uh, of the stock was made about 6.1 billion USD, and the production value was uh, economic value was about 2.1 uh, billion USD. Uh, and this was followed by the estimation of the animal has lost envelope, or simply the overall disease burden. And as described by Will, uh, it is a difference in. Uh, income between the life situation and uh, the current situation, actually the enterprise budget under the Ethiopian situation, which means the absence of a disease, and the enterprise budget under the prevailing disease conditions. So the, this difference uh, gives us the animal health loss envelope. And when we applied this practically into the small land, actually we used a, a gross margin. So animal health loss envelope was conceptualized as, uh, or calculated as the difference in gross margin between the ideal situation and the current situation. We uh, used uh, literature data uh, to calculate the current gross margin. And uh, to calculate the ideal gross margin, uh, actually, we uh, uh, derive data from expert opinion because it's difficult to get uh, the ideal parameters in the literature. Actually, mortality is obviously zero, but the other parameters have to be derived uh, from expert opinion in which we used a Cox method. And um, based on this, we calculated the animal heads loss envelope. And this is an example of uh, the animal has lo lost envelope that we calculated for the different system. This is for the animal has lost envelope for sheep in the crop livestock mixture system. And as you can see here, the left uh, green bar indicates the ideal gross margin, and uh, the right small uh, green bar represents the current gross margin. And their difference is what you call the animal has lost envelope, which was estimated about seven, 735 million USD for uh, sheep in this system. And actually this uh, animal has loss envelope has three components, mortality, production loss, which means a, a, a morbidity burden and animal health expenditure. And as you can see here, uh, mortality uh, is the main contributor of the animal health loss envelope uh, in this system. And the animal health expenditure is a very uh, uh, 
uh, minuscule contributor for, for this uh, alma loss envelope. And the next step was uh, just to divide this overall burden into different causes and what you call attribution. And this is what Negan was uh, describing. And the different components of the animal health loss envelope, including mortality loss, production loss, and animal health expenditure, was uh, attributed to a three broad level causes, uh, which uh, Negan was describing in patients, many patients, and external. And we did this for uh, small months. And uh, actually, these are the, the different uh, specific causes that comes on the broad level cause. For example, when you say infectious disease, it includes uh, parasites like fasciola, viral diseases, and bacterial diseases. And uh, when you say infectious, non infectious disease, it includes um, these of uh, toxicosis or uh, deficiencies, like, for example, malnutrition, hypocalcemia, and etc. And external causes include health problems like accidents, predation, snake bite, etc. And we try to uh, attribute the overall uh, burden into three, these three major uh, or broad level causes. And for this, we need data again, uh, data on the prevalence and incidence of uh, these major causes, like prevalence and incidence of uh, external factors, and patient disease and patient disease. And this is a scarce in the patient, especially for external forces and then patient disease. So we have to, uh, again, derive data from expert opinion for this purpose. And this time we use adiamate of expert elicitation. Uh, which is basically a modification of the depth process that involves these four steps, investigate, discuss, estimate, and aggregate. And from data drive in this way, just we attributed, for example, the mortality uh, burden into these three broad level causes. And we found uh, infectious uh, causes are the major uh, uh, account, the major burden for mortality in small ruminants, which is about 49% and about 8% of more, more mortality burden was attributed to non infectious causes and the remaining 23. We did this also for production losses. And uh, finally, when we, done, when we are done with this uh, attribution process, just we'll be able to fill out these uh, cells or matrices, which indicates, for example, uh, the mortality in neonates is uh, attributed to infectious, non infectious, and external. And we did the same production loss for this uh, sex age category, and we did for the different sex age category. And in this way, we attribute to this uh, uh, broad level causes. And actually, the, the final step is in this uh, case study, just uh, further attribution of this burden into a finer or a specific level causes, which we will do with uh, Negan's team, that is animal health ontology and attribution. And uh, the other is just to pass this overall burden into a wider economic impact team so that they can, they can assess uh, the impact of this burden into the wider economy. And finally, we went also work with the human aspect of uh, this, this burden in terms of zones and uh, uh, food safety that we'll do with the uh, human health team. I think this is my final slide. Thank you for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody, for your attention. And thank you to all the presenters who presented today. And thank you to everybody who participated in all the amazing questions that we received. We will keep track of them all. And also, we will make sure that we keep you all within this community aware of um, of what's going on within our project. I will let you know that you, if you have any questions, you can feel free to please uh, respond to us using the survey monkey. You can have an opportunity to provide us with additional questions or feedback you may have. You can also please do not hesitate to send me an email. I can be reached at um, my email address, which I've just put in the chat, and also if you can copy in the GBAT general email address, that would be great. So in case I'm on holiday or there's somebody else who can answer, they can answer um, your email. But then also please do not hesitate to reach out to each of those presenters who've presented today. Um, we're very um, open to getting comments, feedback, and we also want to see how the work we are doing can really help you all do the work that you are doing because you are at the end of the day also considered as um, some of our part of our end users as well. So please do not hesitate to reach out to us if you have any questions. And on that front, I thank you all and I hand it back over to Vanessa. And I just want to say thank you to LW4D community and to Sebi for really giving us the space to be able to talk to you all today. We can't hear you, Vanessa.
Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, great. I just wanted to say thanks again. That was really uh, very informative. I think there's a lot of potential for collaboration and a lot of synergies. So we do encourage our members to uh, fill out the survey and follow up as requested. And thanks again.